Hello and welcome back to the B-Movie Rollout. Hey, did you see the new James Bond movie? I came here to kill you. This presents a great opportunity for us to talk about the 007 series. Now if you remember, a few years ago I mentioned that my favorite actor to play James Bond was Timothy Dalton. Why me? That's a fair question. Dalton's performances are often overlooked because he only starred in two films during a time when the 007 franchise wasn't doing so well. Timothy Dalton took over the role in 1987 after Roger Moore had been the face of the franchise for seven films dating back to 1973. Additionally, Dalton was offered the role only because future star Piers Brosnan was unavailable at the time. The Bond producers had kept Dalton on a short list for the role since the late 60s because they felt his intensity and classical acting abilities could reinvigorate the series, which at this point was in desperate need of revival. So today, I'm going to explain how he succeeded in doing that and why I feel he played the role better than all of the others, including Connery. We'll do this in two ways. First, I'll recap the two movies Dalton starred in to give you an understanding of how he played the role. And second, I'll compare him to each of the other actors and explain what he did right versus what they did wrong. Remember, we're not arguing about who was in the best movies, we're talking about who was best at performing the role. We have a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. Here's 1987's The Living Daylights. Roll it! In previous reviews, I've detailed the numerous problems of the Roger Moore 007 era. Those films were often overly campy and overindulgent with fantastical plots and attempts at humor that just fell flat. By 1985, this formula had grown very tired, and audiences were losing interest. The series was out of touch, so when Roger Moore finally departed the role, the Bond producers knew that they would have to try something different. By casting Dalton, the plan was to turn the character into, like, a man again, as opposed to the cartoon that Moore had become. Both the character and the films were going to be believable, relatable, and serious. This new take on the series was launched in 1987 with the release of The Living Daylights, to much success. Gone are the plots of world domination. Instead, we have a genuine spy thriller about a corrupt Soviet general faking his own defection in order to cover up a massive heroin deal with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. The plot is complex, but still easy to follow. The characters are also much more down-to-earth. The villains are sleazy and self-indulgent, but never grandiose. The Bond girl, Kara, is well-intentioned, but not overly glamorous. She's a bit of an airhead and easily manipulated by both Bond and the Russian general Koskov. This makes her more believable, as she's just Koskov's girlfriend, so Bond uses her to find Koskov. The two share some genuine chemistry, but this is no love story. Bond's priority is the mission, and there are several moments where Bond visibly does not want her around, particularly during the action scenes. Speaking of, the action sequences in this film are fantastic. Ugh, that's real stunt work right there. Very cool stuff. As for Bond himself, well, Dalton's portrayal hits his mark. He's serious and intense, much like the film around him. His character is clearly a seasoned professional, but he's not, like, dead inside. He seems genuinely happy spending time with Kara, and he gets genuinely angry when another agent is murdered. I will point out that there are a couple of hiccups where Dalton mutters a cheesy one-liner that was clearly meant for a Roger Moore movie. What happened? Assault corrosion. But considering how drastic the change in both tone and style was in such a short period of time, I'm impressed that the remnants of Moore's legacy were restricted to just that. Ultimately, The Living Daylights delivered the breath of fresh air the Bond series desperately needed, and audiences responded very positively. The Living Daylights. This new version of 007 registered well with viewers, so the Bond producers would double down for the next installment with 1989's License to Kill. Roll it!
License to Kill delivers another exciting yet plausible story. The film opens with Bond shadowing Felix Leiter, his friend in the CIA. They capture a high-profile drug lord named Franz Sanchez, and then parachute into Leiter's wedding. The celebration is short-lived, however, as Sanchez escapes custody and exacts brutal revenge on Leiter and his new wife. When Bond finds out his friend has been mutilated, M orders him to get back to work on his next assignment. Bond refuses and becomes a rogue agent, setting his sights on dismantling Sanchez's entire drug empire. This is no simple task, as Sanchez employs a huge network of henchmen. Now, the Living Daylights may have lacked a little bit in the villain department, but License to Kill more than makes up for it. Sanchez's team features a wide variety of bad guys. Some are sleazy, some are bootlickers, and some are just vicious. The ladies of License to Kill are also a step up from the previous film. Pam Bouvier, one of Leiter's contacts, is no damsel. She holds her own in the action sequences, and is very much a partner in Bond's plan to take down Sanchez. Now as for Talisa Soto's Lupe, well, she's pretty useless, but she is believable in the role, as Lupe is more of a prisoner to Sanchez than a girlfriend. Now what License to Kill really delivers on is the action. From the pre-title helicopter chase, to Bond barefoot skiing behind an airplane, to the epic semi-truck chase of the climax, the Bond series was once again able to compete with the high-stakes stunt shows of late 80s action cinema. This is the film where Dalton truly comes into his own as 007. He's angry and intense, almost unhinged, as he's not on any official mission here. He's out for revenge. So this was the first time audiences saw Bond completely off of his chain, which was a new take on an old character. Furthermore, the script was tailor-made for Dalton. It plays to his strengths, and thankfully, keeps the cheesy post-kill quips to a solitary instance, which he delivers with all of the passion of a man who probably argued against saying it. Oh, God, it's Heller. Yeah, looks like it came to a dead end. Come on! That's not to say the film is completely humorless. A cameo from Wayne Newton and an increased presence of Desmond Lewin's Q provide some genuinely funny moments, which are welcome additions. All in all, License to Kill is one of the best in the series, and it is constantly named by Bond fans as the most underrated entry of the whole franchise. License to Kill. So why did Dalton stop after this one? Well, despite what I just said, License to Kill was a flop. Like The Living Daylights, License to Kill suffered some production drama. A last-minute change of the film's title meant that a sizable portion of its relatively small advertising budget would go to waste. Furthermore, the film faced some very stiff competition. 1989 was a big year for action movies, so License to Kill seemed to get lost in the shuffle. And finally, 007's production company, MGM, nearly went bankrupt due to a corrupt and inexperienced studio head who owned the company in the early 90s. It would take six years before another Bond movie was produced, and by that point, Timothy Dalton had moved on to other projects. Pierce Brosnan, on the other hand, was finally available, so he took over with the release of 1995's GoldenEye. In short, I really recommend both of the Dalton films, especially if you're a fan of the recent James Bond movies. The Daniel Craig productions owe a lot to Dalton's tenure. Alright, let's get to the controversial part of the show. I'm going to break down why I think Dalton played Bond better than the others, by detailing what he did right versus what they did wrong. We'll start with an easy one. Hey, how about 007? George Lazenby? George Lazenby was the first to play Bond after Sean Connery's departure, and he only lasted one film. And that's because his attempt, titled On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is an atrocity, an abject failure on all levels. It's a cinematically ugly movie, the action is almost non-existent, and the story is condescending, nonsensical, and outlandish, even for a Bond movie. This all becomes strangely appropriate when you look at Lazenby's performance. His incompetence fits in just fine with the rest of the movie. I won't mince words. I think he's terrible. He's jokey and smarmy, kind of like Connery in his later films, but for a huge part of the movie, He's not even playing Bond. 
Instead, he's playing an alias in order to infiltrate Blofeld's lair. But when he is playing Bond, he's still not really playing Bond. No charisma, no charm, no personality, as he is in way over his head. His empty suit, or should I say empty kilt performance, is painful to watch as this is amateur hour. Lazenby was not meant for a leading role, especially of an established series. He's easily overshadowed by the relatively small amount of screen time given to Diana Rigg and Telly Savalas, who have the other main roles. Not even Telly Savalas can save this train wreck. This never happened to the other fellow. That's because the other fellow was better. All of the other fellows were better. Next. I'm totally serious. I'm a British agent. What? For God's sake, tell him who I am. Ugh, you again. Well, despite what I've said before, Roger Moore wasn't all bad. At least not at first. Moore's debut performance in Live and Let Die is actually quite enjoyable. Basically, he succeeds in every way lays and be failed. His version of 007 is clever, charismatic, and confident. In fact, he's able to walk that very thin line between confidence and arrogance quite well. That's a particularly handsome watch you're wearing, Mr. Bond. May I see it, please? You'll forgive me if I don't get up. He's kind of a prick, but still fun to watch. You don't understand, sir. They'll kill me if I do. And I'll kill you if you don't. But you couldn't. You wouldn't. Not after what we just done. I certainly wouldn't have killed you before. Unfortunately, this did not last long, as in his next film, The Man with the Golden Gun, Moore's character crossed all the way over into unironic arrogance. He was no longer playing a man with the confidence of someone who is the absolute best at their job, but rather the self-certainty of a man who is basically a god that cannot be killed. Not to mention a lame sense of humor. You're not thinking this. I sure am, boy. This basically defines Roger Moore's James Bond for the rest of his tenure, and the series suffers for it. It doesn't help that most of the Moore films are poorly written, cringe-inducing shit shows. Like, what am I looking at here? What is this? Ugh, anyway. There is one cool moment in one of the few decent Moore productions, for your eyes only, where Bond kicks the car of an assassin off a cliff in cold blood. It's one of the better moments of Moore's tenure, so it should come as no surprise that he objected to how it was filmed. He felt that a kill such as this would be out of character for him, which really says it all. Moore saw his role as a campy, light-hearted goofball who goes on exotic adventures. This might have been passable for a while in the mid-70s, but he overstayed his welcome far too deep into the 80s especially when compared to the darker, more serious fare of his action contemporaries. Ultimately, I don't like what Moore did with the character, and I don't like how the producers built the franchise around him. There certainly are some memorable moments from the Moore era, but as a whole, most of these movies are rather forgettable. At the end of the day, Moore really should have been less. Sorry, couldn't help it. Next. You were expecting someone else? Actually, I was expecting somebody better. Okay, I shouldn't start so mean. GoldenEye was actually the first Bond movie I ever saw, and to this day, it's one of my absolute favorites. Mostly because of Pierce Brosnan's performance. Like Dalton, he's intense during the emotional scenes, and the dramatic tension is great during the action scenes. He's clearly focused on the mission, although he's very believable when it becomes personal. For England, James? Additionally, he's quite charming and genuinely funny. Somehow he manages to capture all of the best personality traits of those who came before him while still making the role his own. This is a fantastic performance, and unlike Roger Moore, Brosnan delivered another one in his next film as well. Tomorrow Never Dies gets a lot of grief in the press, and I just don't understand why. The story, action, and characters are all top-notch, and Pierce Brosnan is at the top of his game. His anger after an old flame of his is killed is very relatable, and there are some genuine moments of peril when he's captured, and he's able to deliver some campy yet still fun moments as well. These are two great back-to-back -back performances. 
if he had been able to keep that pace up for his next two movies, today's video might not have been about Timothy Dalton. The quality drop-off between his first two films and his last two films is about as steep as it gets. It's heartbreaking to see him go from two of the best movies in the series to two of the absolute worst. Now, it may not be fair to blame The World Is Not Enough and Die Another Day on Pierce Brosnan alone, as he isn't so much bad as he is just, well, nothing. He's an empty suit muttering awful one-liners that would make Roger Moore cringe. Well, let's just, uh, skirt the issue, shall we? I miss the kill. Well, there's a name to die for. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. <laughs> Say by the bell. What I'm saying is that his performance, or lack thereof, is overshadowed by all of the other terrible aspects of these films. Maybe Brosnan just noticed all the poor acting, weak scripts, and god-awful visuals and figured, well, if these movies aren't gonna try, then why should I? Seriously, look at this shit. This is the silliest visual since Moonraker's Space Battle. In short, Brosnan went two for four. He showed great promise at first, but his last two performances were lackluster and uninspired. And that taints the legacy. Alright, let's move on. Bond. James Bond. Okay, so here's where I lose the rest of you. Well, actually maybe not. I don't have a whole lot of criticism for Sean Connery. I found his performance to be fairly consistent through each of his first six films. Unfortunately, the quality of those films is not consistent, as like with Pierce Brosnan, the drop-off between Connery's first three films and his last two is steep. Unlike Brosnan, however, Connery does not really contribute to the decline of quality in his last two films, especially in the dialogue scenes, which are his strong point. Brosnan's dialogue, on the other hand... So what do predators do when the sun goes down? They feast like there's no tomorrow. ...is atrocious. Now, to his credit, Brosnan was best during his action scenes, which was probably Connery's weak point. His later fight scenes are... <laughs> Unconvincing. Look, Connery was the first one to introduce us to the character and set the standard for who James Bond is supposed to be. So those that follow him must face the challenge of expanding upon the character that Connery established. And I believe Dalton was more successful in doing that than the other three. And Dalton accomplished that immediately. Earlier I complimented Connery's consistency, but on second thought, that actually might be a problem. Six movies is a long time to play a character and not do anything new. Like with Roger Moore, Connery's biggest problem is probably just stagnance in the role. And let's not pretend that Never Say Never Again didn't happen. I don't give a shit about what's canon or not. This is an absolute garbage movie that insults the Bond legacy on every level. And without Connery's involvement, this movie never would have been made. So you can place the blame squarely with him. Now going back to my point, I realize Dalton wasn't around long enough for his character to grow stale. But you've got to understand what that looks like. He shows almost all of the positives of the other guys, but none of the negatives. He doesn't have a bad period. Maybe this is a character that guys shouldn't play for very long. Oh, shit. I should probably talk about Daniel Craig. Well, I've got two cop-outs here. Sorry, two points here. For starters, Craig's first film marks the only official reboot of the 007 series, and I feel it's difficult to compare his Bond 2.0 to the classic 007 era. I feel that he's a new character, free of most of the baggage that the 007 franchise comes with. I know that sounds lame, but my second point is more important. I don't really want to talk about Daniel Craig's character because he's not done with it yet. Forget his goofball comments to the press. He's still under contract and wildly popular. He's not done with 007. So I don't feel totally comfortable commenting on the guy's legacy just yet. You don't have to worry about me. That said, I think he's doing a fantastic job. 
In a couple of years, I may be rethinking my Timothy Dalton preference, because Craig's been knocking it out of the park again and again. Most of my compliments about Dalton apply to Craig as well, and he doesn't have any of the flaws of the others. I think the 007 franchise is currently in good hands, but today's video is really more about Bond's history. Right now, Dalton is still my guy, and I'm not the only one. All I'm trying to do is vocalize why we like him, and hopefully making a strong case for giving his movies a chance. The James Bond franchise is storied and lengthy, but it would be a terrible mistake to let Dalton get lost in the shuffle. Give him a chance and tell me what you think. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. Ooh, the Living Daylights? The movie where Timothy Dalton single handedly saved the Bond franchise? Wait, but that's a good movie. Switch the bloody machine off!